Amen. <clears throat> praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. We welcome you to another Sincere Milk of the Word. Lord's House of Prayer, Tuesday night Bible study. Amen. And the word of the Lord says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile, And all hypocrisies and envies and all evil speaking. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Amen. That's where we get our um, name. Sincere milk of the word. Amen. And we thank God for his word, for by we are warned and in keeping of it, there is a great reward. Amen. We thank God for all those that are coming on. I'm going to give a few more minutes and then we're going to um, get into the word of God on tonight. Amen. We praise God for all of his goodness and hope everyone had a blessed day. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. So we're going to go ahead. Our opening scripture on tonight is going to be from Psalms um, chapter 1. After we have a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for your goodness and mercy, for your love and kindness, for your grace and your truth on tonight. Thank you for all that you've done, all that you are doing, for all that you are about to do. <clears throat> and Lord, we thank you, Lord God, for all your people everywhere. Pray, Lord God, that you would look on your people, strengthen your people, encourage the hearts and the minds of your people. Lord, we pray that you would stir the hearts, cause us to seek your face like never before, we pray in the name of Jesus. And now we pray that as we open your word, you would open our hearts, cause us to hear what your spirit will say to us this night. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. And Psalms 1, very familiar passage of scripture. Amen. Psalms 1 and 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Amen. Amen. And this is truly the blessing plan. If you want to really be blessed by God. He said, just walk in his ways, keep his statutes and his commandments. Amen. And um, you can't help but to be blessed. Amen. He said, I bless you going out. I bless you coming in. Amen. And so we thank God for his word on tonight. And so we're gonna, we might not be on too long tonight. We'll see how the Lord leads, but... Um, it's just a word, a specific word that God had given me on earlier today, and I wanted to share share it with you. And we'll be coming out of Second Corinthians, the seventh chapter. Amen. We're going to begin reading at the first verse. However, we're going to really begin to focus at the eighth verse. Amen. And our um, thought on tonight is we're going to deal with the seven marks of godly sorrow. The seven marks of godly sorrow. Amen. Because all sorrow we're going to learn is not godly. It's not motivated or inspired by God. 
but we're going to look at the seven marks that let you know for yourself when you have really been um, touched by the grace of God and caused to be brought to a place of godly sorrow. Amen. Because sometimes we'll deal with it as we get into it. But sometimes people are sorry um, because they got caught. Amen. Amen. But godly sorrow, we're going to see the seven marks that let you know that yourself have been become godly sorrow. But you can also see it working in others. Amen. And so that's what we're going to deal with tonight. And we're just going to go as God leads us. But um, let's begin at um, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning with verse 1. It says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Let me go back to the sixth chapter. What, what promises? He's saying, Having these promises. He says, um, we'll go back to 6 and 11. O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you, our heart is enlarged. Ye are not straightened in us, but ye are straightened in your own bowels. Now for a recompense in the same, I speak as unto my children, be ye also enlarged. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness. Amen. Sometimes it's not because you don't like a person or anything like that, but you, you, we can't fellowship with everybody because if you're walking in the light, the Bible said two can't walk together except they what? They be agreed. Amen. And when you didn't make up your mind, you're going to seek God with all of your heart. It's going to cause you to um, break fellowship with those that are not of that same mindset because you no longer have fellowship with that person. Amen. Look at verse 15. And what concord, the same thing as communion, have Christ with Belial, or what part have he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. Here, here's the promise. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. That's the promise that God has given us. Amen. But then what does he say? Verse 17, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Amen. Come out from among them. Why? Because the Bible says God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. So if you're going to walk with God, you're going to have to come out the darkness because he don't fellowship with darkness. Amen. And that's why the religious leaders of Jesus' day didn't have any fellowship with him because he was in the light and they were what? In the dark. Amen. He, he asked him, he said, why is it that you can't... Um, Hear my words or understand my words, he said, because you can't hear. You don't have an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Okay? And so look at verse 18. And I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So he said, the promise is, if you come out from among them, he said, um, I will, um, wherefore come out from among them, be separate. Well, what did he say in verse 16? Um, he said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and will be their God. And they shall be my people. Verse 18, I will be the, the, a father unto you and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Now, verse set, um, chapter 7 and 1, having therefore these promises... Dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. That's what we're working on. We got this um, um, shut-in coming up Friday night. What are we going to be working on? Cleansing ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit, seeking to perfect holiness, walking in the fear of God. 
Amen. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Then he says, receive us. We have wronged no man. We have corrupted no man. We have defrauded no man. I speak not this to condemn you. This is Paul talking to the Corinthians. And something I want to say about this as we continue through it. Second Corinthians was written as a follow-up to 1 Corinthians. In the 1 Corinthians, he was um, seeking to straighten some issues out that they had going on in the Corinthian church. Amen. And so um, 2 Corinthians, he's writing to and, and saying the things that he told them to do, they had done them and had corrected where they were going wrong. So that's giving you a little backdrop. Okay, so verse 3 says, I speak not this to condemn you, for I said before that ye are in our hearts to die and to live with you. Great is my boldness of speech towards you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all your tribulations. For when we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side with outward fightings, with inward fears. Nevertheless, God that comforted those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you when he told us of your earnest desire, your fervent mind towards me, so that I rejoice the more. Because when he took this letter to, um, to the um, Corinthians from Paul, to, to um, help straighten some things that was going on wrong. They had some marriage issues that they were straightening out. They had the issues with the gifts, the mishandling and the misuse of gifts, and just several things they had going on. Amen. They had a person there that was um, committing adultery or fornication with his father's wife. Amen. In other words, he was it was probably his stepmother or Yes, yeah, stepmother. And so Paul had written to them, seeking to straighten all that out. Okay? And this is what's going to bring us to verse 8. He said, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. Yeah. Amen. Because Paul, when he wrote that letter, he let them know what they were doing right and what they were doing wrong. And then what they needed to do to correct their um, walk with God. Amen. And so we have to understand that's what the Word of God comes to do. It don't just come to make us happy. Sometimes the Word of God will make you sad. It depends on where you are. Amen. Where you are in your walk with Him. Amen. Because He said, for though I made you, verse, we're in 2 Corinthians um, 7, verse 8, for though I made you sorry with the letter, and that was His first epistle to the Corinthians, I, though I... I do not repent, though I did repent, because it wasn't Paul's desire to make them sorry. Amen. It's, it, and it's never even my desire. Um, in some of the preachings, teachings, they can be pretty tough, but it's never a true man of God's desire to make the people of God sorry. Amen. But sometimes we need to be made sorry so that we can um, look at Amen. So that we can consider where we are and and if we're not where we need to be according to the word that we can come up because the Bible says that Christ is in us the hope of glory, the hope of coming up to the glory that we all have sinned and come short of but all, don't all have to keep sinning and coming short of. And so we have to get it right. So let me read it one more time. For though I made you sorry with the letter, I do not repent. Though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle have made you sorry. Watch this. Though it were but for a season. Amen. Just for a time. Because sometimes, like I said, um, when the word comes, it comes to reprove, it comes to rebuke, and it comes to exhort. And wherever it finds you, 
That's what it's going to do in you. That's why you can be in a, in a service where a word is being preached and you have some folk is rejoicing and then you got other folks that might be weeping because it all depends on where that word finds you. Amen. But the good thing is when you have a heart towards God that when it finds you where it should not find you, you seek to come up to it. And that's what happened with the Corinthian church. So he said it made you sorry for what? A season. And we're going to see why it made him just sorry for a season. Look at verse 9. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry. And that ain't why I'm rejoicing. But watch this. But that ye sorrow to repentance. See, that's the key. Amen. When I preach a word, and, and I'm telling you what thus saith the Lord, and I'm telling you, you know, what we need to be doing, what we shouldn't be doing. It's not that I'm trying to make you simply sorry, but I want to make sure that if you're in that state, in that condition, where, where my joy comes in is when you sorrow to repentance. Amen. When you sorrow to the point that you make a change. Okay, so this is what Paul said. I'm rejoicing, not that you were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. Okay, in verse 9, it says, For ye were made sorry, watch this, after a godly manner, a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. Amen. A godly manner, a godly sort. Amen. The word of God pointing out your shortcomings and and then telling you what you need to come up. Amen. So that's being made sorry after a godly sort. Amen. Whenever God uh, makes us sorry, it's, it's for a good reason. Amen. Because really what he wants to do is rejoice our hearts. See, that's why the scripture that we read opening up, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Amen. Why? So that you can re rejoice, being in a, in a state of rejoicing, because you're walking in the light, as he is in the light. Amen. But when we step out of the light into the darkness, God has to send his word into that dark place and find you. Amen. And convict you of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Why? To get you back on track. Amen. So that's what we understand. The word of God, that's why it comes. Amen. To warn us. As I always say, it's not about condemnation. It's about reconciliation. Reconciling condemned men back to God. Getting them out of that condemned state. Amen. And so... Um, this is what Paul, he's explaining it to him. Amen. And he said, um, look at verse 10, because here, here we go. For godly sorrow, he said, you were made sorry after a godly manner. It was simply Paul preaching the truth, dealing with their issues, letting them know what they need to do to come up to the standard. That's all he was doing. Okay. Okay, look at verse 10. For godly sorrow worketh or produces repentance. Okay, that's what godly sorrow. When, 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 when God is working in your heart and bringing you to a place of being sorry for your sin, it's going to produce repentance in you. It's going to produce a change in you. Amen. Because that's what um, the grace of God comes to do when it, it, it um, deals with us about our sins. It's seeking to turn us from our sins. Remember what we read in on Sunday where God said, um, Israel had went astray, but God said for his own name's sake, he was going to bring them back to the place where um, he could bless them. He said, I'm not doing it for your sake. I'm doing it for my name's sake. Amen. I'm going to have mercy on you and I'm going to forgive your sins and I'm going to cleanse you. I'm going to turn you. Amen. I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to give you a new mind. Amen. I'm going to put my spirit in you and it's going to cause you to walk in the light as I am the light. That's what? Godly sorrow. 
That's the word of God working in you. Amen. Producing what? A change. I always say repentance is not a 360. It's a 180. You were going south. Now you do a 180. Now you're going what? North. Amen. You, you made a total different change. You were walking in the dark. Now you're walking what? In the light. Amen. And, and so you have to get that understanding because we got a lot of bad teaching going on that make people think you can keep walking in the dark, but because you made a confession. Amen. And you might have even cried a, a few crocodile tears. Amen. That everything is all right. Or because you went down in the water or because you felt a, a, a quickening or something. No, no, no. Repentance produces what? A change, and it takes godly sorrow. It takes God working in your heart. That's what grace is. God working in you, watch this, the will and the do. See, God has to produce a will for you to change before you will really change. That's godly sorrow, okay? So he said, godly sorrow worketh or produces repentance to salvation. Amen. Not to be repented of. Watch this. But the sorrow of the world worketh or produces death. Why? Because the sorrow of the world doesn't produce a change. Amen. A lot of times people are not sorry, as I said in the opening, um, for what they did. They're sorry because of the consequences for what they did. They're sorry they got caught. Or they're sorry of what they lost because of what they did. Often people... Um, go to jail, and the uh, only thing they sorry is they got caught. And so when they go to jail, what they do is they study harder. So when they get out, they ain't going to change. They just going to be a little sneakier. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Because it's not godly sorrow. It's the sorrow of the world. Amen. And it's just a temporary something, but it doesn't produce the change that God is seeking to produce in our life, or that is necessary. Amen. Good point. Deacon Rashad, Judas had worldly sorrow because after he had um, um, betrayed Christ and, and Christ kissed him and said, friend, betray if thou me with the kiss, then he was sorry. Amen. And, and he tried to repent, but he found no place of repentance. So he ended up, what, hanging himself. That was the sorrow of the world, and it produced death. Amen. Good point. All right, D. <laughs> Amen. And and um, so we want to make sure what's working in us is godly sorrow. And, and so we're going to look at the seven uh, marks of it. Now, before we get to that, I want to uh, deal with that word, what I mean by uh, mark. Y'all have to, I got off kind of later than I intended to. Okay. It is a, a boundary land or a, a boundary, a conspicuous object serving as a guide for travelers. Some things such as a line, a notch, fixed object designed to record position. Okay, I want to. Okay, a standard of performance. Okay, a distinguishing trait or quality, or here it is, characteristic. Okay, so when we talk about seven marks, we're talking about seven characteristics or distinguishing traits or qualities of godly sorrow. That's what we are talking about. Amen. Um, distinguishing marks. Amen. Marks that you can look and say, okay, you can actually see, okay, God is working in that person's life. Amen. And so uh, he's working in my life. Okay. So let's go back to verse 10. For godly sorrow worketh or produces repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh or produces death. Okay. Look at verse 11. For behold, this selfsame thing, that ye sorrowed after a godly sort. 
Okay? Now, here's the first thing that godly sorrow will work in you or will produce the first characteristic. He said, what carefulness it wrought in you. Amen. What carefulness it wrought in you. And the word careful means um, eagerness, um, earnest desire, forwardness, diligence, okay, haste, with haste. Amen. The Bible said, when um, God warned um, Noah of the flood, the Bible said he moved with fear and prepared the ark. Amen. And so he said, earnest diligence, um, to give diligence, interest oneself most earnestly. Earnestly. So he says, this is what it produced in him, a carefulness, amen, an earnestness to make a change. And that's what um, godly sorrow is, it, it does in you. It produces a carefulness um, in you. Amen. It, it, it makes you, okay, look more earnestly at the way you're walking. Amen. I'll never forget when uh, the enemy um, sought to get me off with certain things. And then when as God brought me back to the straight and the narrow. I had to look earnestly and carefully at what, how I ended up, where I ended up from where I was. Because when I first got saved, I had such a heart and a desire for God. So I had to understand what happened. Amen. So that godly sorrow for where I was produced a carefulness in me, an earnest seeking to um, see how did I get here and how do I get back where I need to be? So that was the first thing it, it produced in him. What carefulness it wrought in you. It says, yea, what, what? Clearing of yourselves. Amen. What clearing of yourselves. Okay. That, that simply means to, well, one of the words here we have is a plea or apology. Amen. Amen. Clearing of yourself. Amen. Seeking to get that thing right. You know what's wrong with a lot of folk? They want to do their mess, but they never want to apologize. They just want to act like nothing ever happened, and we just pick up where we were in the first place. Well, how can you pick up where you were when you're no longer there? Amen. So we have to understand, when you become godless sorrow, you will be willing and ready to apologize. Amen. To say, I'm sorry. Amen. You'll humble yourself because you want to what? Clear yourself. Amen. Because you have that earnest um, uh, desire in you. It said a reason statement or argument. Amen. You got to get the revelation. Amen. When when I when I get wrong, amen. I'm I'm trying to go to the person I wronged or and, and get it right. I got to say, you know what? I apologize. I shouldn't have said that that way or I shouldn't have done that. And you know, it's hard to do that when you're full of pride. And that's why you got to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Amen. Because if you want to be forgiven by God, you got to apologize. Don't you know God don't, don't, uh, you, you mess up with God in, in, in scripture. I forget where it is, but he told him, he said, when you come, in repentance, bring some words with you. <laughs> Saying, Lord, forgive us, for cleanse us. That's how you come back to God. Amen. With a brokenness. Amen. So he said, what clearing of yourselves that it wrought in them. Amen. Seeking forgiveness from God and from your fellow man, the person that you have wronged. So the first thing he said, it worked carefulness. Remember the seven characteristics. The next thing, a clearing of yourself. I like a saying that I saw on Facebook one day. He said that um, an, apo uh, an apology without change is manipulation. Amen. Because some people, they'll say they're sorry, but they don't show they're sorry. But when you really sorry, you intend not to let that thing happen again. Amen. Early on in, in our marriage, uh, I'll never forget this because it probably, it hurt me probably as much as it hurt her, but 
she may didn't know it at the time because it it hurt. But um, me and my wife, my wife said something to me, and I mean, I snapped. I mean, I with my tongue, I cut her deep and deep made her cry. And man, that thing when I, I was so sorry that I did it. Amen. But I I I, I purpose not to let that happen again. And I don't think that has ever happened again like that. Amen. Because I sought to clear myself. Because what the Bible says that uh, the man that does not love his wife doesn't love himself. Amen. When you hurt someone you love, you going to hurt. Amen. And so that's why that's so important. We have to understand that. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I clear myself. And I don't... Um, I don't treat my wife. I mean, we don't always agree, but I, I, I'm, I'm very careful with my tongue because I ain't trying to hurt him. Amen. And so, but I had, I had that showed that was a sign of what repentance. Amen. And and it brought in me a clearing of myself, so an apology, so we can get this thing right. Okay. So that's number two. Number three, yea, what indignation, okay, irritation, vexation. Now, what I get out of that indignation is you get mad at sin working in you. You get mad at the devil for causing you to do what you did. Get indignant about that thing and put on the whole arm of God seeking to what? Make sure that thing don't happen again. Sometimes what it do, I never forget when I first got saved, and I thought I was completely free of cursing, but as God turned up the fire, one of them old curse words fell out of my mouth. And um, the sign that a repentance godly saw was working in me was I became indignant about that. And I put this flesh on a fast. I put it on a three-day fast because I said, this can't be keep happening. And I saw God. Amen. And... Um, when I came off that fast, it happened one more time, and that's been about 40 years ago, and I have never said another curse word. Amen. But I, it, it, it worked in me an indignation against sin. Amen. And even, and I've done some other things, but what godly sorrow has done in me, it's worked that indignation in that clearing of myself, making sure that I don't go back to that. Amen. Taking the necessary steps. Amen. You got to come to a place, saints of the Most High God, that you hate sin. Amen. Because what you really hate, you're not going to keep tolerating. You're going to become indignant. You know you'll put up with stuff from folk you love, but if you don't really like a person, any little thing they do can set you off. That's how, that ought to be your attitude towards sin. Thank you. Oh, glory to God. That ought to be your attitude. So three things. Carefulness, it wrought in you. Clearing of yourself. Apologizing. Um, three, indignation. Amen. Getting upset with sin, whatever that is in you. And, and next thing it says is, what fear? Amen. Fear of God. Amen. What fear? Uh and that and a, an alarm, uh, a, a phobia, okay? What fear, amen? And, and that's what that's what it ha that's what happened to me. I'm going to use this because this is a good example. For example, when the enemy tried to get me um, uh, caught up in pornography, amen. And I'm not caught up in it. I don't have no desire for it. But he tried to get me caught up in it. Because I wasn't being watchful. But when I understood what was happening, and I, um, it, it walled in me a carefulness, clinging of myself, and indignation, and a fear. Amen. A fear, the best way I can say it is, um, I'm careful what I set before my eyes. Because I know how I ended up in that situation. That's why. Um, I, I don't watch TV hardly at all. I don't hardly watch anything because I understand. Um, when I went back and, and, 
and did a pathology to see how I had got to the place where I was, what I found out, the things that got me there, I thought wasn't nothing wrong with it, but them little foxes, and then one thing will lead to another, when another, and another. And that's what you have to understand. But it it brought fear in me. Amen. So sometime now, um, you know, I call them little um, internet prostitutes and whatnot. They want to um, friend you on Facebook. Amen. I look, sometimes I don't even click on the thing. I can see where they're coming from. I delete them right away. That's because of what? Fear. I don't want to get caught up in that anymore. So I'm careful now about what I said before my eyes because of what? What fear it wrought in you. Okay? That's number four. And what vehement desire, earnest desire, what? A longing to what? Please God. A longing to keep my heart pure and clean. Amen. And that's why sometimes the flesh wanting to do certain things. But no, I say I, I'm not I'm not even gonna take that chance. So you have to there's a desire, a, a earnest desire to please God. This is what we're talking about. The seven things that godly sorrow produces in us. How you know the characteristics of godly sorrow. Amen. And uh the next thing it says, what zeal, what zeal, and that's just another form of, of earnest desire, being zealous for the things of God. Amen. Um, seeking to get in the word and um, in order to build up as my your spiritual immune system is a deacon person to say. You, you, you. You get in the word and it builds up your immune system. The word of God will build up your spiritual immune system so that these things won't be able to take hold of you. Okay. And the last thing he says, yea, what, what? Revenge. And I'm going to tell you one of the ways that I get revenge on the devil. Watch this. Is teaching y'all the truth. <laughs> Amen. Telling y'all. Amen. Be watchful what you're watching. Amen. Be careful who you're hanging with. That's, that's how I get revenge. Because if I can turn someone away from the thing so they don't have to experience maybe some of the things that I had to experience. That's me getting revenge on him. Amen. And so um, these are the seven things that godly sorrow will produce in you. The characteristics Amen. And let me go back over them. What carefulness it wrought in you, clearing of yourself, indignation, fear, vehement desire, zeal, and revenge. Amen. When God is working in you, there's going to be a change. Amen. And, and you're going to, um, I remember um, when um, somebody, these people were trying to uh, uh, send me little websites to go to, little nasty websites. And um, I would get so upset with them because I know it was just a snare. I know it was a spiritual attack. And I would get so mad. Amen. But then the way I started getting the revenge and getting back, and the Lord just said, start shooting them some scripture back. <laughs> So I started shooting scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I started witnessing to him right in, in the text or right with the um, email. However they send it to me, I shot it right back at them. Started shooting the word back because what I had been doing is just deleting it. I said, no, because they keep doing it. So I just started shooting them scripture back. You know what? They left me alone. <laughs> Hopefully somebody got saved. Amen. And not long ago, somebody um, sent me a little something. It was in a, a it was a mass thing trying to uh, sit. And so I, I let them know that um, I'm a man of God and I don't do that. And I gave it. And then I just witnessed to him. I, I wasn't, it wasn't no um, 
Um, I wasn't looking down on him, nothing. I understand. I witnessed to him. Amen. And I sent it back in the mass. Because you never know when you um, put that word out there, that seed out there. You never know who it might touch. Amen. But I let him know. Don't come here with this if you don't want what I got. Because I'm going to shoot it back. Amen. You hit me, I'm going to hit you back. Amen. With the word. Amen. And so that's what I, I learned to do. Because you understand we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers. This evil spirits get in these people and have them target you. And you got to understand that. Amen. But uh, let me get back to my... Scripture somehow it Romans seven. I mean first Corinthians chapter seven. So um those are the seven characteristics. Amen. Those are the seven characteristics of godly sorrow. When you when godly sorrow you can see it working in yourself, amen. Because like I said, sometimes people cry and it's just crocodile tears because it doesn't produce a change. Amen. But when, when, when the word really is working in you, you're going to start seeing what? A change taking place. Amen. And this is what happened to the Corinthian church. When Paul sent that letter, he said, I wasn't trying to make you sorrow. Amen. But I know it made you sorrow because of Sorry, because of where you were, but he said, the thing that I'm glad about is not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. And these are the characteristics. This is how I know you sorrowed to repentance, because you started um, doing things according to the word of God. Amen. See, and we need, because here's, here's another thing that was happening at the Corinthian church is... Um, they were allowing, even though they knew this man was um, having sexual relationships with his father's wife, he said, um, y'all weren't, you, you weren't doing anything about it. You were just kept shouting and dancing all over it like nothing was happening. And, and what happens when that happened is that sin began to spread throughout the congregation because there is no what? judgment on it. Amen. And that's what is lacking in the church today is there is no judgment against sin. And so it just starts to spread. Amen. But what happened in the Corinthian church, amen, they started correcting some stuff because he told them, he said, um, you rejoicing when you need to be judging that man. And so they ended up judging him. Amen. And he said, when you gather together with my spirit to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the soul might be saved. Let me say this. You do nobody a favor um, making them think they okay and they sin. You do no one a favor because the ways of sin is still death. You got to tell folk the truth, whether they like it or not. Now you hope that they repent, but if they don't, You've done what you are supposed to do. Amen. And, and so that's so important um, that we get this revelation. Amen. And so um, this is uh, the word that God has for us. Amen. Because true repentance, uh, it requires change. It demands change. Amen. You've got to um, change what you're doing. Amen. Because sometimes... The reason why we keep getting the same results is because we keep doing stuff, what, the same way. I like that saying that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing the same way and expecting a different result. <laughs> Amen. But you got to make the necessary changes. I believe um, Sister Tiana said, if you want something you never had, you got to do something you never done. Amen. To get it. Amen. You got to make a change. Amen. You want holiness. Yeah, you got to start drawing out to God. Amen. And he'll draw out to you. Amen. You can't keep um, watching the same things, hanging with the same people. Amen. Reading the same books. 
Can't keep doing the same thing and expect to get a different result. Amen. But the word of God tells us what we need to do in order for us to um, get the results that God have for us. Amen. So we thank God for his word tonight. Amen. I felt like tonight might be a little shorter than normal. Amen. But I'm, I'm giving you what God has given me to um, give you on tonight. Amen. And just dealing with those signs because um, when a person truly repents, um, you can see it. You can see the change. Amen. And that's God working in them. The will and the do of what? His good pleasure. And I, and I do want to say this in closing because I know I teach strict. I know I teach um, and what they say is tight but it's right. But I want to encourage us in this way that it's not you that's going to do it. It's God's going to do it in you because you are seeking him. Amen. He's going to work that stuff in you. Godless sorrow is God's work in you. God is making you sorry. Because all this is, is when God make you sorry, this is going to be the results. Those seven things, you'll start seeing it in your life. When when God made me sorry for my sin, amen. I, I did cry, amen. But there wasn't no crocodile tears because I changed. I'll never forget the young man that was working with me. When God saved me, he said, man, you did a 180 degree change. Amen. And why? Because godly sorrow was what? Working in me, changing me. Amen. Um, and, and making me, I used to love to go to the movies. Amen. But it made me afraid to go to the movies because I didn't want what was at the movies. <laughs> Are you following me? And so you, you have to understand because I want to say that as a way of encouragement, because sometimes we'll get discouraged because we tried and it ain't working. But what did the Bible say? Ask and it shall be given. Seek and ye shall find not, and it shall be open unto you. Ask God to deliver you. Ask God to take everything out of you that is not like him. Amen. And work in you repentant. Amen. And watch, watch what he'll do. Amen. He'll make a change. Amen in your life. And sometimes you don't even realize it until you look and one day you realize, oh, I used to do this, but I'm not doing that no more. And are you following what I'm saying? Amen. And so, amen. It's so important that we uh, get, get God's word. Amen. So we thank God for his goodness and his mercy. Amen. And we, um, the Lord bless um, we'll be look to see you again on Friday. Oh, thank God for Jesus. Because Friday night, amen. I guess Sister LaShonda said, had no service, just went black. Okay, I guess her service messed up. Amen. So, Friday shut in. And I said we was going to start at um, nine, but no, we want to start assembling if the Lord bless for um, 7.30. And we'll probably end up letting out earlier, but if we can start assembling for 7.30, because at eight o'clock, we want to do our regular Bible study. It's just going to be done from the church, but f we're going to do our regular Bible study at eight o'clock from the church. Amen. So I'm going to be there for Lord bless for 7.30. But if you, we can, if you can just get there by 8. But whatever time you get there after that is fine. Because we're going to be there at least until maybe about... Um, we'll see how the Lord leads. Because sometimes, you know, he leads differently. But I'm thinking between 3 and 6. But we just play it by ear. You might can't come stay all the night. But if you come stay an hour or... How the Lord lead you? Because we just come to lay out before God and cry out to God. Amen. Because I'm seeking for perfection, but I'm not declaring I'm perfect. But I'm saying, God, perfect that. The work you started in me, I need you to perfect it. And that's what we're coming. So we're going to be praying. 
we're going to be, do we have Bible study books? No. What? Okay, I have to, I'll talk to you, Luana, make sure I understand what she's saying. But um, that'll be Friday night. So um, we're going to start Bible study. We're going to be on Facebook at 8 o'clock. Amen. And I'm going to try to get there for 7.30. Or for, uh, actually, I'm going to try to get there for 7. And go back, because that's the other thing the Lord's dealing with me about, is going back to the church for Bible studies on Fridays so that we can have our corporate prayer from 7 to 8 and then Bible study from 8 to 9. Okay, Sunday school books. Okay, we don't have new books now. Um, um praying about that um, what we're going to do with Sunday school but we'll be letting you know um, probably by next month amen so um, let me go back over what we're going to do Friday night 7 o'clock prayer 7 to 8 prayer 8 to 9 Bible study and then at 9 we go into shedding amen alright so God bless you, and pray you have an awesome night. I want to read this um, scripture God has just given me to um, close out with this scripture. It says, verse 17, and I want you to remember this, no matter what you're going through, for a light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Amen. God bless you. Have an awesome evening.